So in this video, we're going to cover chapter one and talk about science as a way of learning. This is basically going to be your introduction to the class. And so let's go ahead and dive in. So in chapter one, there are three big ideas that we're going to walk through piece by piece. And so we'll start off talking about biology, uh, which is the scientific study of life. Ology is the study of, bio is life, so the scientific study of life. So we'll talk about what makes things be classified as living, um, how are things broken down, etc. Then we'll move on and we'll talk about the process of science. So how do we go through and look at the scientific method? And then finally, we'll finish off talking about the five unifying themes in biology. So we're going to start out with the nature of biology. So science is an inquiry-based way of knowing. It's a body of knowledge about the natural world, a collection of unified insights about nature, the evidence of which is an array of facts. And so a couple keys here, right? Facts are important. In science, we deal in facts, not just what people use in everyday language as a theory, you'll see later that an actual theory is something different entirely. Biology is the scientific study of life. Now, biologists ask a wide variety of questions, all related to life and how it works. And there are many, many different subspecialties within the, the umbrella of being biology. So some scientists might look at how does a single cell develop into an entire organism. So this would be like a developmental biologist. This is what I studied as an undergrad, right? For me, I was always fascinated. How does that one cell know which end is a head and which end is a feet? And one side is left and one side is right. <clears throat> so how are those signals that tell that one cell to develop into an entire organism? So some biologists might study that aspect of life. How does the human brain function? Neurobiologists would study this. Um, how do living things interact in a community? So this would be like an ecologist, for example, would study how living things interact, right? So looking at predator-prey relationships, um, other types of interactions among members that live in a community. So biology is very broad, and there are many different fields within it. But again, they're all related to life and how it works. So we need to start off by talking about what is life? How do we classify something as being living? And so life is defined by a group of seven characteristics that are possessed by living things. And we're going to walk through and talk about the seven characteristics. Now, a key for this is that life or living things are composed of one or more cells. The cell is the fundamental unit of life. That is the smallest part that is considered living. So life is composed of one or more cells. So let's look at what are the properties of life. How do we, um, how do we classify something as being living? And so to classify them as living, there are seven characteristics. First, all living things exhibit order. They're highly organized compared to inanimate object. They have, you're gonna see later, that structure and function are related. So living things have a particular structure that is related to their function. And so organisms are highly organized compared to inanimate objects. All living things maintain a relatively constant internal environment through what is called homeostasis, so keeping the body the same, through regulation. Think of your body, for example. Your body maintains homeostasis. Your temperature is going to be at roughly 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. How does your body maintain that relatively constant internal environment? Well, we our body responds to environmental conditions. Think of if you're hot. If you go outside in the sun during summer, 
what's going to happen to your body as a result. And that is that as your temperature goes up, your body's natural response is to sweat. The sweat serves the purpose to help bring down the temperature. If on the flip side, you go to uh, Minnesota in the winter and it's freezing cold, right? And your body is cold. What is your body's response going to be to cold temperatures? Answer, shivering, right? Because that movement is going to help to raise your body temperature. So living things maintain a relatively constant internal environment. All living things grow and develop. Think about us, for example, right? We start out as one single cell. Egg and sperm come together during fertilization. We start out as a single-celled zygote. Do we stay a single-celled organism? No, we don't, right? We grow, we develop, we go from one cell and to trillions of cells. Even single-celled organisms grow and develop. All living things utilize energy. All living things have to be able to take in and use energy. So for us, for example, the way that we get energy is through the food that we eat. We are, you're going to see later, we are what's called a heterotroph. Hetero, other, troph, feeder. We have to consume our food in order to survive. Other organisms might use sunlight, for example. That might be their form of energy. What organisms can you think of that do that? Plants, right? Plants do a process called photosynthesis. They are able to convert solar energy, meaning energy from the sun, and convert it into chemical energy, which means to make, right, to make glucose. They make their own food. But all organisms have to utilize um, energy. All living things respond to their environment. Even organisms as simple as bacteria, they respond to their environment. They can display something called chemotaxis. Chemotaxis means that they respond to a chemical signal. Sometimes it might be a positive chemotaxis, meaning they go towards the stimulus, let's say food, right? They're attracted to that food. Other chemical signals might work as a negative chemotaxis, meaning that the bacteria is then going to move away from that chemical, like if it's a waste product or it's toxic. So all living things, even simplistic organisms, respond to their environment. All living things reproduce. They have to give rise to more organisms. Now, does that mean that if, let's say, a person is infertile, like they're not able to have kids, does that mean that they're not living? No, right? But as a general whole, living things can reproduce. And lastly, all living things evolve from other living things. They all come from one universal common ancestor, one cell that started out and eventually gave rise to all the diversity that we see in life. So this is just breaking down and looking at some examples of the different properties of life. So again, if we look at order, we can see um, this plant has a very ordered structure. If we were to look at, let's say, a pine cone, a pine cone is a very organized, ordered structure. Reproduction, right? So notice we have an elephant and they gave rise to a baby elephant, right? So all living things can reproduce. Living things can grow and develop, right? So we see this um, animal hatching out of an egg. So it's growing and developing. Energy processing, right? So this, um, this insect here is eating a plant. It's taking in energy and it's getting that energy from the food that it eats from the plant. The plant gets its energy from sunlight, but all living things have to process energy. Response to the environment. So what you're looking at is a Venus flytrap. And that Venus flytrap, when its prey lands in the Venus flytrap, 
it's going to respond and it's going to close to capture its food. Regulation, right? So this regulation, you're seeing this um, lizard that is laying out on a rock and in the morning when it's colder and they need some warmth, they will go lay out in the sun to regulate their body temperature. And then lastly, all living things evolve from other living things. So they have what's called evolutionary adaptations, right? So if we look at this fox, it has this thick fur coat, which is used to help keep it warm. That's an evolutionary adaptation. If you think of evolutionary adaptations, other examples could be camouflage, right? Some insects, for example, blend in with their environment, and that's an evolutionary adaptation. It gives the insect an advantage because it makes it more difficult for that animal to be prey because the predators can't see it. So that's evolutionary adaptation. So every living thing on earth belongs to one of three domains of life. Our three domains of life are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. All members of domain bacteria and archaea are single-celled microbes. They're what we call unicellular. Uni means one cellular cell. They're made up of one cell. They are referred to as microbes because they're not able to be seen with the naked eye. You have to have a microscope to be able to see these organisms. Bacterial and archaeal cells um, do not have a nucleus. They don't have a membrane-bound um, nucleus. The DNA is not contained within a separate membrane. And as a result, bacteria and archaea are what we, what we call prokaryotes. Prokaryotes, pro means before. Karyote is kernel, like corn, before the nucleus. So bacteria and archaeal cells, <clears throat> those two domains, they are made of prokaryotic cells. In contrast, all organisms in domain eukarya are composed of one or more cells that have a nucleus. And because they have a nucleus, we say that they are eukaryotic. Now, notice bacteria and archaea. Those are always unicellular. Eukarya can be either unicellular or multicellular. So historically, domain eukarya is composed of four main kingdoms. So you're going to see in a minute that when we look at how living things are classified, domain would be the most broad form of classification. Then as we start to get more specific, the next layer of classification is the kingdom. And so within domain eukarya, there are four main kingdoms. We have plants, animals, fungi, Protus. Now, Protus, you'll see a note here that says actually multiple kingdoms. And that's because historically it was this four main kingdom system. However, scientists are now reclassifying Protus and separating them into separate kingdoms. And that's because historically the way that an organism was classified as being a protist would be that if it was a eukaryotic cell, but it wasn't a plant, it wasn't an animal, and it wasn't a fungus, if it didn't meet any of those three, it was put in this other drawer, which is this grouping of protists. So if you think about protists, I think of it as kind of being like the junk drawer. Pretty much everybody has one in your house, right? You have some drawer in your house where when you go to clean up and you don't know where to put something, you stuff it in the junk drawer and you say, I'm going to deal with this later. Kingdom Protista was the junk drawer. Scientists didn't know how to classify them. They weren't a plant. They weren't an animal. They weren't a fungus. So everything else got put into the protists. And so we're going to look at some examples 
of organisms that are in these main kingdoms. So this is looking at the tree of life. So again, life arose from a universal common ancestor. And at some point, that one cell diverged into multiple lineages. And we end up with this three domain system. Domain bacteria, domain archaea, domain eukarya. Remember that bacteria and archaea, these are going to be your prokaryotic. cells. Remember that means that they do not have a nucleus. So if we look at domain bacteria, for example, we have our gram positives. Um, an example of a gram positive would be streptococcus pyogenes, which causes strep throat. We could look at um, staphylococcus epidermidis. Epidermidis, where do you think that tells you that that bacteria is normally found? epidermis, which is your skin. We have uh, purple bacteria. We have what's called cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria is able to do photosynthesis. It's able to do photosynthesis like plants. It's an aquatic bacteria and it's able to take sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water and convert that into chemical energy in the form of sugar. Life on earth would not exist if it hadn't been for cyanobacteria, life as we know it. Because one of the main contributions that cyanobacteria has had is that because it was able to do photosynthesis, it was evolved before plants, so these were precursors, they were around before plants, and because cyanobacteria was able to do photosynthesis, one of the byproducts of that process is oxygen. And so the presence of cyanobacteria allowed the concentration of oxygen to get high enough in the atmosphere for other types of organisms to form, what we call aerobic organisms, ones that use oxygen. We are aerobic, right? We have to take in oxygen in order to survive. And you're gonna see later that that's because we do a process that's called cellular respiration. We break down our food, we use our oxygen, and we do that so that our cells can make ATP for energy. So you have to have that oxygen, that's why we have to breathe. You need to have that oxygen for cellular respiration to occur. Domain archaea, so these organisms tend to be our extremophiles, extreme lovers. We have our methane producers. We have our salt lovers. Um, there's a type of archaea that's called halobacterium. It is a type of archaea. It's not actually bacteria, but it's a type of archaea that can grow on salt crystals where many other organisms can't be found. We have our hot acid lovers. So again, notice that these organisms are found mainly in places where other organisms can't survive. These archaea have adaptations that allow them to survive under these extreme conditions. Now, interestingly, if you look at this diagram, you'll notice that this universal common ancestor branched into two lineages. One way went to domain bacteria, and then the other gave rise to a common ancestor of archaea and eukarya. And if you see a tree like this, what this tells you is that scientists have discovered that archaea are actually more closely related to domain eukarya than they are to bacteria. So even though bacteria and archaea are both prokaryotic, Domain archaea has more in common with the eukaryotic cells, the domain eukarya. And so that's a very interesting fact. Now, within domain eukarya, right? Within domain eukarya, again, we have a generalized four kingdom system. Protista, plantae, animalia, fungi. 
if we look at kingdom protista, right? So we have our amoebas. So we have our single cell protists. Um, we have our flagellates, our dinoflagellates, which cause a red tide. We have our diatoms, which are these crystalline looking organisms. But our protists, um, in many cases, um, protists tend to be more animal-like in many cases. And the ones that are more animal-like fall under this protozoan. Um, and so they tend to have more in common with the animals than these other domains or these other kingdoms of life. In kingdom plantae, we have our flowering plants. We have our evergreens or our conifers, our cone-bearing plants. Uh, we have our ferns. We have our mosses. These all fall under kingdom plantae. Kingdom animalia, animals. You probably know an infinite list of animals. Mice, lizards, fish, sea stars, snails, jellyfish, humans, right? All fall under kingdom animalia. And then lastly, we have our kingdom fungi. Kingdom fungi, molds, mushrooms, and yeast. Molds, mushrooms, and yeast would fall under kingdom fungi. Now, before I continue on with this, I want you to think for a minute. Viruses. Think of the coronavirus that's going, out, going around right now. Based on those seven characteristics of life, are viruses considered to be living? And the answer is, is that scientists do not classify viruses as being living. And this is for several reasons. One, remember that I said that the fundamental unit of life is the cell. A virus is not made of a cell. It is not a cell. It has a protein coat called the capsid, and it has nucleic acid in the middle. It doesn't have the other typical structures that a cell would have. The other reason that viruses are not considered living is that they do not have the ability to reproduce, meaning on their own, they cannot make copies of themselves. They have to infect a host cell in order to reproduce. So it's not unless they get into the right type of cell. So in humans, in the case of COVID, respiratory cells. It likes to attach to and infect cells of the respiratory tract. And so when that virus is on the surface, that virus can only survive outside the body or remain active outside of the body for a certain period of time. After that, it's, gonna, it's going to become inactivated. And that's because viruses are not living. So without a host, they're not able to reproduce. They have to be within a host in order to reproduce. So viruses you're not gonna see in one of these tables because viruses are not living. We don't typically classify them as being living because they're not made of cells. So if we are classifying living things, we have our Linnaean system of classification. And in this Linnaean system, again, domain is the most broad. And in this example, the domain is eukarya, meaning eukaryotic cells. The way that I can remember this classification scheme is for me, I love mnemonic devices, especially for lists. And so throughout the semester, you'll see me giving you mnemonic devices or ways that I remember things because I find that if you have an association, it makes it much easier to remember than just trying to memorize straight. So for me, if I have a mnemonic device and I have this other sentence that I use to help me keep the order straight, it makes it much easier. So for me, for this, the way that I remember this is I remember this do is domain, keep, pots, clean, or 
family gets sick. So do keep pots clean or family gets sick. That helps me keep my classifications in order. Domain, the most broad, right? So within domain, eukarya, remember we have our plants, we have our animals, we have our fungi, we have our uh, protists. So when we classify something as a kingdom and we're in animalia, these are the animals. So what makes the animals different than, let's say, the plants or the fungi? Well, first, animals, the cells, animal cells, do not have a cell wall. Fungi do. Plants do. Animals are um, heterotrophic. They have to consume their food in order to survive. That makes them distinct from plants because plants are what we call autotrophs. They're self-feeders. So when we get into kingdom, we're getting more specific, right? Within domain eukarya, once we get to kingdom, we're getting more specific. We've basically ruled out the plants and the fungi, etc. So kingdom animalia, you can see a fish, a worm, a bear, cats, lions, butterfly, mice. These are all within kingdom animalia. Then we get to phylum chordata. Now we're getting more specific. Organisms in the phylum chordata, what they have in common is that they have a structure called a notochord. And a notochord is a precursor to a vertebrae. So now the worm is out and the butterfly is out. They don't have a notochord. So phylum chordata, we still have our fish, we have our bear, we have our cats, we have our lion, and we have our mouse. Then we get to class, getting more specific. Class, mammalia, mammals. These are animals that the females have mammary glands to feed their young. They feed their young using their mammary glands. They also have hair. Do fish have hair and mammary glands? No, the fish is out. So we still have our bear, we have our cats, we have our lion, and we have our mouse. We get to order. Order is going to be carnivora, carnivores. Mouse is out. Mouse eats uh, plants. So we still have our bear, our cats, and our lion. Then we get to family. Notice family and family makes it easy to remember. Family in this case, we're getting more specific. Felidae, think of felines, the cats. So the bear's out. So we still have our cats, we still have our lion. Then we get to our genus. Our genus is gonna be felis. So these are more kind of the house cats. So the lion's out. And then our species, is going to be Felis domestica. Felis domestica, that is what we call a binomial nomenclature. Bi, two, nomial names, meaning it's a two name system. So Felis domestica, Felis is the genus. We capitalize that. Domestica, is the species that is written in a lowercase. So when it's typed, you'll see an organism's name in italics. If it's handwritten, if you were writing this out yourself, so let's say we're talking about humans, our name for our species for humans, Homo sapiens. Homo is our genus, sapiens is our species. So if I'm writing this, the H is capital, the S is lowercase, I underline genus and species separately. That's the proper notation for organism names. So we are Homo sapiens. You can probably think of other species of Homo that you've learned about in your life. 
Homo Neanderthal, so our Neanderthals. We have Homo erectus, right? Homo sapiens, etc. Now, we need a biological definition of a species. And a species is a group of organisms that have the ability to breed and produce fertile offspring. So a species is a group of organisms that have the ability to breed and produce fertile offspring. Both of those components are important. So a mule, which is a cross between a donkey and a horse. A mule is not a species. It's not able to reproduce and give rise to fertile offspring. So a donkey is one species and a horse is another species. They're not the same. Yes, they can breed together, but they don't produce fertile offspring. So a horse is a separate species than a donkey. So that's a species. Now, like all things in science, while this is the biological definition of a species, obviously this doesn't work in every case. Bacteria, for example, you can't use this definition to describe a species of bacteria because bacteria don't have to breed and produce fertile offspring. They reproduce asexually without a partner. They simply just duplicate themselves, they make a copy, and divide into two. So it gets a little bit different when you look at other types of organisms. But this is kind of a generalized definition of a biological species. So if we look at life, life is arranged in a hierarchical manner meaning that the lower levels of organization are progressively integrated to make up higher levels. The fundamental unit of matter is the atom. Chapter two, we're going to learn a lot about chemistry. We'll talk about the parts of the atom, etc. So our first layer to this hierarchy is the atom. So in this case, we're looking at a hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom has one proton, one electron. Very simple. You can put atoms together to make a molecule. In this case, water is a molecule, H2O. It's when you put two hydrogens with one oxygen. So notice that we're putting atoms together and we're making a molecule. We can put molecules together to make up an organelle. So we could have, if we're looking at the nucleus, it's made up of different types of molecules. The nuclear envelope is composed of lipids. The genetic material within the nucleus is made of nucleic acids. So notice that this structure, this organelle, is a collection of different molecules. So you put molecules together, next level is gonna be the organelle. You put organelles together, you get a cell. And again, the cell is the fundamental unit of life. So in this case, we're looking at a neuron, a nerve type cell. And so it has a very specific structure related to its function. It has axons, this long extension. It has dendrites, these little hairs that look like, they look like hairs coming off of it. Those are projections that allow neurons to communicate. This cell is made of 
multiple organelles. It has a nucleus. It has ribosomes. It has mitochondria. It has lots of different organelles combined to make up the cell. We can put cells together to make up a tissue. So the tissue could be the nervous tissue. It could be made of um, neurons. It could be made of connective tissue. Um, it could have blood vessels in it, right? That's a tissue. So it's a collection of cells working together for a common function. Put tissues together. We end up with an organ. In this case, the organ is going to be the brain. So the brain is going to have nervous tissue. It might have vascular tissue, so blood vessels. Um, it has different types of tissues that come together to serve a common purpose. Put organs together, you end up with an organ system. So in this case, the organ system is going to be the nervous system. So that includes the brain, the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves, all of those organs put together make up an organ system. You put various organ systems together, you end up with an organism. So in the organism, you have multiple different organ systems. You have the nervous system, you have the cardiovascular system, you have the urinary system, you have the integumentary system, so the skin. There are multiple systems working together to make up the organism. So in this case, the organism is a sea lion. If you have a group of sea lions living together, it's all one species living together, we call that a population. So when we talk about population ecology, we'll talk about how one species interacts. So population is one species. In the case of the sea lion, a population of sea lions we refer to as a colony. When we put all living things together, so not just the sea lions, but now the kelp and the fish and the other organisms that all live together, we get a community. So the community are all the living things. And all of these living things are interdependent on one another, right? We have predator-prey relationships, etc. Then we put living and non-living things together. We get our ecosystem. So all of these living things plus the non-living components. So the water, the temperature, etc. The ecosystem. The example in this case, the Southern California coast. That's the ecosystem. It's not just the living things, but it also includes the non-living components as well. Then we have our biosphere. And the biosphere is when we put all of the ecosystems together. So the desert and the tundra and all the other types of ecosystems, you put them all together, you get a biosphere. And our biosphere for us is obviously going to be Earth. That's all of those ecosystems put together. And so life is hierarchical. It builds on multiple levels and multiple things come together to make up the next level. So this would be a type of question that if we were in lecture, what I would have you do in this case is normally by the second day of class, you would come in and you would sit wherever you're going to sit for the semester and where you sit, you would form a group and that group would be your group for the rest of the semester. Things are a little bit different because we're not in person. I will still do some group work in Zoom, but it's not going to be quite the same as what I would do if we were in lecture. So one of the things that I like to do when I'm teaching this is I like to give these multiple choice questions. And for me, the reason I do this when I teach this in class is that it's instant feedback for me to see if you get the material. 
So I like to break it up and ask you a question every so often just to kind of see, are you guys getting what I'm talking about? And so I would ask this type of question and I would tell you to talk with your group and pick the color that your group would vote. Each group would have a group folder. And when I would tell you to, you would hold up your color answer that your group is voting. I would look at those and see what percentage of the class got it right. If everybody got it right, I know that that material was taught well enough and it's ready to go on to the next part. If let's say half the class missed the answer, that means I need to go back and refresh and make sure that you're understanding this. Now, obviously that's not the case when we're not in class, but what I will do throughout the semester is sometimes I won't give you the answers in the video, but I'll actually have you discuss them when we meet on Zoom. For this first lecture, I'm gonna give you the answers right here, right now. But just be aware throughout the semester, I won't always give you the answers in the video. In some cases, you'll get it in the Zoom when we have our discussions. So this would be our question. If you eat a hamburger, you are mainly eating ground up beef muscle. Which levels of organization are represented in this ground up muscle? So are we looking at red organism, population, and community? Yellow, organ, organ system, organism. Green, organelle, cell, tissue. Or blue, tissue, organ, and organ system. So I want you to think about this. Pause it while you think. And when you're ready, push play to hear the answer. Okay, if you said green, you are correct. Organelle, cell, tissue, right? So the muscle cells working together make up the muscle tissue. Within those cells are various organelles. We don't have an organ system, right? Because we're not looking at all the organs um, put together in, in the in the example of the muscle. It's definitely not red um, because red organism, population, and community, organism is way past muscle, right? That's all of the organ systems put together. Populations are referring to all of one species living together. Community is referring to all living things. This, you're just looking at one specific type of tissue. So those are not the answer. There's not an organism because again, the muscle is only one part of the organism. It's not including the whole organism. So the answer is green, organelle, cell, tissue. So now we're gonna talk about how does science impact the everyday world? So what I want you to do first is <clears throat> to read through these different statements. And when you're ready, I want you to pause the video and answer for yourself whether or not you think these statements are true or false. So first one, early humans coexisted with the dinosaurs. Is that statement true or false? Antibiotics kill bacteria and viruses. The father's genes determine the sex of the child. The sun goes around the earth. Continents are moving on the Earth's surface. The oxygen we breathe comes from plants. So pause the video, think about your responses for all of these. And then when you're ready, go ahead and push play. So true or false, early humans coexist with the dinosaurs. What did you say? The answer is false. The Flintstones lied to you. Humans and dinosaurs did not coexist. Dinosaurs were extinct for millions of years before humans walked the earth. 
before humans existed. So humans and dinosaurs did not coexist. Antibiotics kill bacteria and viruses. That statement is false. Antibiotics only kill bacteria. They do not kill viruses. One, because viruses are not living. And two, many antibiotics target things that are specific to bacteria, like penicillin, for example, targets peptidoglycan, which is in bacterial cell walls. Viruses don't have cell walls, so it doesn't have an effect on viruses. Um, some drugs target different types of metabolism. Some drugs target um, DNA replication for circular chromosomes. Bacteria do this, viruses don't. So antibiotics are useful for bacteria, but not viruses. And so that's why if you get a cold, for example, you shouldn't go to the doctor and demand an antibiotic because that antibiotic is not going to be effective against that cold virus. It will work if you have, let's say, strep throat, because strep throat is caused by bacteria, but the antibiotic is not going to kill viruses. That statement is false. The father's genes determines the sex of the child. That is true. Females have XX as their sex chromosomes, which means that they always give their offspring an X chromosome. Males, on the other hand, males are XY. If the male gives his X chromosome, the offspring is going to be female. If the male gives the Y chromosome, the offspring is going to be, uh, if they give a Y, it's going to be a male. So it's the father who determines the sex of the child. So all you men out there, you can't get mad if your wife, for example, doesn't give you a boy. That's not on her. That's on you. Females do not determine the gender of the child or the sex of the child. The sun goes around the earth. That statement is false. The earth goes around the sun, right? The planets orbit around the sun. Continents are moving on the earth's surface. This is true. They have moved consistently over time, very slowly, but they do move. The oxygen we breathe comes from plants. That statement is true. Now, let me be clear though. The oxygen that we breathe comes from plants. Yes, plants do provide some oxygen, but technically you might also be able to say that's false because bacteria also produce that oxygen. But we're gonna keep it simple. The oxygen that we breathe from plants, true. So a survey was done um, to Americans, and the survey is about probably eight years old now, but it was looking at to see what percentage of the American population knew the correct answers to these true-false. So let's take a look. So in terms of early humans did not coexist with the dinosaurs, only 48% of the American public knew that, that, knew that statement. So half of Americans thought that humans and dinosaurs coexisted. Antibiotics kill bacteria, but not viruses. Again, it's about half, so 51%. Um, again, this is in large part um, part of the driving force behind antibiotic resistance, misuse of antibiotics, um, antibiotics being prescribed when not, nece when not necessary. Um, and that's because a lot of people simply don't understand that antibiotics will kill bacteria, but not viruses. The father's genes determine the sex of the child. 65% of Americans knew that. The earth goes around the sun. 75% of Americans knew this. Continents are moving um, on the earth's surface. 79% um, knew that. The oxygen that we breathe comes from plants. 87% knew that. So what this tells you is that Americans' knowledge of science is uneven at best, meaning that we might understand as a whole, as a country, we understand some concepts 
more than others. And if you look at this, one of the things that strikes stands out to me is that we looks like we tend to know earth science. So more of the physical science, people understand that better than let's say biology, life science. And you've probably seen this now with all the stuff going around about coronavirus, right? That people don't really understand viruses and they don't really understand the biology behind it. And they're putting out false information. And we'll talk about that later on. So this is just kind of interesting to look at how far we've come um, in science. So the world's first programmable computer was produced in 1948. This computer was six feet by 15.5 feet. So just think about how massive this computer was. And if you look, its memory was 128 bytes of memory. That pretty much does just about nothing on a common or on an everyday computer that we use, right? Our, our computers have a much higher capacity than that. Here's a small computer from 2007. If you think about our cell phones, right? Those are little handheld computers. Flash drives, those little teeny drives, have 10 million times more memory capacity than that massive computer. Science has come a long way. And you're gonna see this more and more as we go throughout this session. So now we're gonna look at the process of science and talk about how science uh, is performed. So again, science is a way of knowing. It's an approach to understand the natural world, meaning that it's a way that we go about explaining some aspect of the natural world. Science uses evidence-based process of inquiry to investigate the natural world. And the scientific approach involves observations, so observing something to work a particular way, a hypothesis, which is your educated guess, predictions, so testing uh, or predicting what the outcome of an experiment would be when testing a hypothesis, test of the hypotheses via experiments or additional observations, and analysis of data. When we talk about a scientific theory, it's very broad in scope, and it's supported by a large body of evidence. So again, when we talk about a scientific theory, that is not the same as when we talk about and use the term theory in our everyday lingo, right? People might say, oh, I have a theory about that. They're making a guess about something. But in science, a theory is supported by evidence meaning you have to have evidence in support of that theory. Can you ever prove a theory? The answer is no. You can never prove a theory with 100% certainty. You can provide evidence that supports that theory, meaning it's disproving the alternative hypothesis, but you can never prove a theory. It's never, it can't be proved. It can be supported by evidence, but you can't ever prove a theory. So there, these are listing some examples of different theories. So one is what's called the cell theory, and that is that all organisms are composed of cells and new cells only come from pre-existing cells. We have homeostasis, that's a theory. The concept is that the internal environment of an organism stays relatively constant within a range that is productive of life. Again, your body temperature has to be maintained within a relatively small window. You can't get large fluctuations in temperature or you die. So homeostasis needs to be maintained. Evolution, this is one of these central themes in biology. 
In evolution, the concept is a change in the frequency of traits that affect reproductive success in a population or species across generations. Meaning, the better adapted an organism is for their environment, the more likely they are to survive and pass those traits on with greater frequency to the next generation. When we talk about data, there are two main types of data. We can have what's referred to as qualitative. Qualitative means that they are recorded, recorded descriptions. So if we look at Jane Goodall, who's a scientist, she studied uh, chimpanzee behavior. That would be a qualitative, in many cases, a qualitative type of data, describing their behavior, describing what she sees. If we say that data is quantitative, that is something that can be recorded measurements. We could say they eat five grams of bamboo every day or whatever it might be, but you're talking in terms of numbers now. In terms of which is stronger types of data and evidence, quantitative, right? Because numbers are not subjective. Qualitative recorded descriptions can be somewhat subjective. For example, I could say, you know, that that man is not very tall. And let's say that that man is five foot nine. That man is not very tall. Well, to some people who are maybe five feet tall, a five foot nine man is relatively tall. But I'm 5'10", and so to me, I might perceive 5'9 as being not very tall. So notice that I have my own bias, right? I have my own opinion. Um, it's very subjective. And so qualitative data is not as strong as quantitative. If I say how tall that person is and I say that they're 5'9", that is much more telling than just simply saying, that man is not very tall. Well, what do you consider tall versus not tall, right? And so that's where the subjectivity comes into play. So now we're going to walk through and we're going to talk about the scientific method. So the first part of the scientific method is the observation. And the observation is a piece of the natural world that's observed to work a certain way. So let me give you an example. Let's say that I decide to go camping and I'm starting to pack all of my stuff. I'm packing my bags to go camping. Go to the garage, take out a flashlight to bring a flashlight, go to turn on my flashlight, flashlight won't turn on. My observation, flashlight doesn't work can't get the flashlight to turn on. That's the first step, right? I have my observation. Next, we have our question. The question is the what, why, and how. So if I'm looking at my observation is that the flashlight doesn't work, what would be my question? What question would I ask in response to this observation? And the question would be, why doesn't the flashlight work, right? Why doesn't the flashlight work? I observed that the flashlight didn't work. Now I'm asking the question, why doesn't the flashlight work? Then we have our hypothesis. And the hypothesis is a tentative, testable explanation for an observed phenomenon. So key, tentative, testable has to be something that you can test because if you can't test it, how can you provide evidence in support of it or disprove the alternative hypotheses? So my hypothesis can't simply be a ghost made my flashlight not work. Well, can I test that? No. So that's not a good hypothesis. So in order for it to be a good hypothesis, it should include a possible cause, right? So seek to answer the question. 
Use information from past experience. I've probably dealt with at some point in my life a flashlight not working. So I would draw based on my own experiences for my educated guests to answer my question, right? And so a good hypothesis should use information from past experience. Or in some cases in science, that past experience might be somebody else's research. So based on another group's findings, I might have a hypothesis to answer some other question. So I'm using information that's already known. Generate multiple hypotheses when possible, what we call the alternate hypotheses. A good hypothesis should be testable. You should be able to test it. Can be eliminated, but not always confirmed. So again, we can disprove a hypothesis, meaning we can eliminate one, but not always confirmed. So my first hypothesis I could say, probably the most simple one, the one that I would have around the house, hypothesis number one, batteries are dead. That's my educated guess. That's my educated guess to answer my question. My hypothesis is that the batteries are dead. Next, we have our prediction. And our prediction is going to predict what the outcome of the question will be prior to conducting the experiment. So basically when you're thinking about your prediction, you're thinking about if you do an experiment, what would you predict to see if your hypothesis is correct? So the prediction will allow the scientists to design the experiment to test a specific hypothesis will be an if-then statement. So often you'll see predictions written in if-then statement, and it will state the results expected if the hypothesis is, is supported. So prediction, replacing the batteries, will fix the problem. So notice that I am talking about the experiment and in this case, the experiment would be to change the batteries. And I'm predicting what the outcome would be if my hypothesis is correct. Now, if I put it in the proper if-then format, um, if I change, if the batteries are changed, then the flashlight will turn on. That's my if-then. So if, and then what are you doing in your experiment? Then, what do you expect to happen? So, if the batteries are replaced, then the flashlight will turn on. That's your prediction. Next, you have your experiment. And your experiment is the controlled test of the question at hand. This is where you're actually going to be testing your hypothesis. There are several key elements in an experiment. One, perform the same experiment multiple times, keeping all elements the same each time except one. So typically when we do a study, you have to do it more than once. Doing it just one time is not strong enough evidence to be sure of your conclusion. You need to repeat the experiment several times. The one adjustable condition in the experiment is what we call the variable. So when you do an experiment, you should only change one variable at a time. If you change more than one variable, if you change more than one aspect, you can't say which variable caused the effect. You can only change one variable. Everything else has to be maintained the same. A control condition can be thought of as an experimental condition that exists prior to the introduction of any variables tested. So my control in my flashlight experiment, right, would be the flashlight with all of its original components. The variable, right, if I'm, if I'm testing to see if the batteries work, 
my experiment would be to change the batteries. That's the only thing I'm changing. I'm changing just the batteries and seeing what the outcome is. So my test of my prediction would be to simply replace the batteries. So let's say that I replace my batteries. So if your hypothesis was falsified, you then propose an alternative hypothesis. So if I replace the battery and the flashlight still doesn't turn on, well, then if that's the case, right, then I can rule out that it was the batteries. So now let's think of what the best approach would be to test something else. So start with the alternative hypothesis. So notice in my flashlight experiment, the results, the flashlight doesn't work, and my hypothesis is contradicted. So it was not the battery. Hypothesis number two, the bulb is burned out, right? So if I changed my batteries and the flashlight didn't turn on, it's not the, it's not the batteries. Now think about this. If I leave the new batteries in, if I leave the new batteries in, and now my hypothesis is that the bulb was burnt out, the prediction would be that replacing the bulb will fix the problem. The test of the prediction would be to simply replace the bulb. The result, flashlight works, hypothesis is supported. So now we have evidence in support of the hypothesis. Now, if I left in, if I left in those new batteries and then I changed the bulb, do I have only one variable from my control? Answer is no, because I have new batteries and a new bulb. So if both of those have been altered and the flashlight turns on, well, is it just the bulb alone? Was that enough to allow the flashlight to turn on? Or was it the bulb and the batteries? So notice, if you have more than one variable, you cannot make an assumption about if your hypothesis is supported. So the correct way to do this experiment would be after you test the batteries, put back in the original batteries, then change the bulb. If you change only the bulb and the original batteries are in, and now it turns on, now you can make the appropriate conclusion. And that is that it was the bulb that was burnt out because changing only the bulb allowed the flashlight to turn on. So that is something that you really wanna think critically when you hear about people making claims about something in science, you got to think critically. Did the, is the way that they did the study the correct way? Did they change more than one thing? If there's more than one variable, you can't make a very good conclusion about the results because which thing that you changed had the greater effect. So it's really important in the scientific method that for a particular experiment, it only can have one variable, one thing that's changed. That's it. So question for you, which of the following statements best describes the nature of a scientific hypothesis? Red, a hypothesis is an idea that is widely accepted as a description of objective reality by a majority of scientists. Yellow, a hypothesis must stand alone and not be based on prior knowledge. Green, a hypothesis must be testable through experimentation, observation, or mathematical demonstration. Blue, a hypothesis is the same as an observation. Purple, for any scientific question, there is only one hypothesis tested. So go ahead and pause Think about what your answer would be. And then when you're ready, push play to hear the answer. So if you said green, you're correct. 
Red is a hypothesis is an idea that's widely accepted as a description of objective reality by a majority of scientists. That is not the hypothesis. That is instead a theory. It's based on a collection of data and it's widely accepted by a majority of science, scientists. Yellow, a hypothesis must stand alone and not be based on prior knowledge. That is not true. We want a good hypothesis to be based on prior knowledge, right? We're drawing on previous exper experience to help us come up with our educated guess. It should be testable, right, through experimentation, observation, or mathematical demonstration. Not every hypothesis can be tested with an experiment. And so there are other ways that we actually go about um, testing a hypothesis other than an experiment. Blue, a hypothesis is the same as an observation. That is not true. An observation is the first step. The hypothesis is the third step. It's not the same thing. For any scientific question, there is only one hypothesis tested. That's not true, right? You want to have multiple hypotheses if possible because that allows you to rule out the alternatives, which then provides more support in terms of your hypothesis. So the answer for that one is green. So a controlled experiment is when we have, in an experimental test of a hypothesis, researchers often manipulate one component in the system and observes the effect of this change. That's a controlled experiment. Only one variable is changed. The factor that is manipulated is called the independent variable. That's the thing that's going to be change, changing. The measure that's used to judge the outcome of the experiment is called the dependent variable. This variable depends on the manipulated variable. We are going to talk a lot more about independent and dependent variables in lab when we get to lab two, because in lab two, we're going to start to discuss how to do a graph how to do a proper scientific graph. And so in order to set up a graph properly, you have to understand the difference between which is the independent variable and which is the dependent. And so I'm gonna skip that for now because you are gonna hear this in lab. A controlled experiment compares an experimental group with a control group, right? So your control is nothing has changed. Your experimental group is where that one component, that one variable is manipulated. So the use of controlled and experimental groups can demonstrate the effect of a single variable. For example, researchers found that mice models that did not match their habitat had higher predation rates than camouflaged models. So this was a field study, meaning that it wasn't done in a lab, but actually out in the population. And so what scientists noticed was that the beach population of mice um, had a lighter coloration, whereas the inland population of mice had more of a brown color. And notice that the color of the mice in those environment matches that of the environment which suggests, and the hypothesis would be, that they have that coloration because it helps them escape predation. So what the scientists did was they made um, 250 plastic models of mice, and they either painted them the native color, meaning for the beach population, they painted them the lighter color, or they painted the non-native population, meaning the other color, the brown. And so they took these 250 painted mice and they scattered them randomly throughout the environment. And they did this in both the beach population, the beach area, as well as the inland. And then they monitored to see 
how many attacks were on these plastic models. So what you're looking at is if we look at the data for the beach, the light habitat, the number of attacks on camouflage models, meaning that in this case, that's your control. Those are the mice that would blend in with their environment. Two of those mice were attacked. However, number of attacks on a non-camouflage model means that when they put those brown mice, the brown painted mice, in the beach population, there were five. So the percent attack on non-camouflage models, 71%. So 71% of the mice that were attacked were not camouflaged, suggesting that if they're camouflaged, they're less likely to be eaten. Same thing if we look for the inland or the dark habitat. So the control in that experiment is going to be the brown. That's the native population. Five of them, right, five of them um, that were camouflaged were attacked. So in the inland population, five brown ones were attacked. And 16 white ones that were placed in the inland population were attacked. So again, we can see 76% were attacks on the non-camouflage model. So again, this suggests that this coloration that we naturally see in these environments is an advantage because it allows them to escape predation. It allows it to escape predators. Now, think for a minute. They did this with painted models. They didn't use actual mice. I want you to think about why that might have been the case. What advantage does that give them about using the painted models versus using the mice? Remember when you think of an experiment, only one variable. So if you did this experiment and you use the actual mice, what if the mice themselves had some sort of behavioral adaptation that allowed them to be, that allowed them to survive better? Meaning it wasn't simply due to their coloration. So again, this is our controlled experiment. They did this with painted models because the painted models are the same you're not having to worry about them running away or hiding better or whatever. It's based on their physical appearance. So that is better than doing this, let's say, with the actual mice, in which case there might be more than one variable. And so this is just to show you an example of a controlled experiment. And what this experiment showed is that if the mice looked like their environment, they were more likely to escape being preyed upon. Hypothesis can be tested in humans with clinical trials, as well as retrospective or prospective observational studies. Retrospective or prospective, retrospective means like looking back on observational studies or prospective means like looking into that um, through observations, not actually a trial. We'll come back to those in a minute. A clinical trial will have the subjects picked at random and placed into one of two groups. The experimental group that gets the drug that's being tested and the control group gets what we call a placebo. What that means is that you don't want to give one group a pill, the experimental group. You don't want to give them a pill and the control group give nothing. That's going to influence your experiment because the group that gets nothing knows they're getting nothing and they might, you know, say that their symptoms are worse because they know they're not getting treated. So instead, the best way to go about these trials is to have a placebo they might give the control group a sugar pill, meaning there's no active ingredient in there. It's just to simulate like the patient is getting the drug so that the patient doesn't know whether they got the drug, the experimental drug, 
or whether they got the control, the placebo. So a placebo is an important part of a study. You need to have a placebo so that it doesn't influence um, the person's behavior. Even better is what's called a double-blind trial. And in a double-blind clinical trial, neither the researcher nor the participant know who's in which group. So the physician that's giving the drug does not know whether the person has the drug or the placebo. And again, that comes down to inadvertently, the doctor doesn't necessarily mean to, but if a doctor knows which patients are getting the drug and which ones are getting the placebo, they might treat the patients a little bit different based on that knowledge. So even better to basically take away any bias is a double blind. The scientist, the researcher, the physician, whoever's giving the drug doesn't know who's getting the treatment, nor does the participant, so that there's no outside influences on the result. The result is based simply on the outcome of the drug. Clinical trials can be cut short if preliminary research shows that the treatment is either significantly harmful or significantly beneficial because it would be unethical to knowingly harm participants or withhold effective treatments. So if some drug is showing a huge amount of promise, they might not proceed at the same rate. The process might be spread up, uh, sped up. And that's because if you know that a drug works really well, you don't want to continue that trial at a slow pace and withhold that effective treatment. Similarly, if you see that the drug is harming the patients more than it's being beneficial, you don't want to continue that trial because it's unethical to give people drugs that are going to make them more sick. So it's not unusual for clinical trials to be cut short if it goes, if preliminary results go one way or the other. When we talk about retrospective or prospective observational studies, this is looking for correlations. Like if the patient were to eat a lot of oatmeal, did it lower their risk of heart disease? That could be retrospective. They could be, scientists could ask questions to patients who have had like a heart attack, for example, and to look at aspects of their diet and see if there's any correlation between having those that had a heart attack versus those that didn't to see if there's any correlation. The problem with that kind of study, though, a correlation, is just because there's a correlation there doesn't necessarily mean it's a cause and effect. It doesn't necessarily mean that that caused the effect. Yes, there's a correlation there suggests that there's that that might have an effect, but you can't say without with 100% certainty. You can't say that which one causes which. So, just to get you guys thinking because a lot of things are floating around about COVID right now. So, this is a um, post from a friend of mine. I have blocked their name off, uh, but they posted this article on Facebook. And if you look on CNN.com, so the the page that was posted um, by this person, notice the title. The title says, Study Finds Hydroxychloroquine Helped Coronavirus Patients Survive Better. And this friend of mine says, it works. Like, hey, look, hydroxychloroquine works. Trump was right. This was effective. Now, If we look at the actual article though, if you click and you actually go to the article, the title of the article does not say that anymore. It says, study finds hydroxychloroquine may have boosted survival, but other researchers have doubts. So I posted the link for this and this will also be in a discussion board. But what I want you to do is I want you to read through this article. 
I want you to think about it critically. And so the participation assignment, this will be a discussion board. Read through the article and then describe the problems with the claim that hydroxychloroquine is effective against COVID-19. Hint, think about the way they designed their study. There are multiple flaws with this experiment. So I want you to read through the article and I want you to post what you saw as being problematic with that study. And then once you do that, you'll start to see the problem with people just simply looking at headlines and then posting, you know, it works. Yeah, but if you really read the article, is that really what it said? It's spreading misinformation. And that is something you don't want to be responsible for. You want to be responsible for only sharing good information based on scientific data. So my, my question for you is to go through and read the article, see if you can find the problems with this study. And again, there are multiple problems. You can probably come up with a whole list of things that were not done well in this experiment. And so, again, this is an exercise to get you guys to really think critically because there's so much information coming out daily about the coronavirus and about COVID, the disease. And you want to be able to look at something and read it critically. Don't just trust what you read, but read it critically and see if the data actually um, the data is actually in support of that claim. Is that a well-designed study? Is that what the study actually shows? So that is going to be your participation assignment for this lecture, is to read this article and comment on problems that you found with the study. So hypotheses can be tested using observational data. And scientists test hypotheses about the evolutionary relationships of red panda. They wanted to know, were the red pandas more closely related to the raccoons or the giant pandas? And so based on observations of physical similarities, scientists initially hypothesized that the red pandas were more closely related to raccoons because physically they look more like the raccoons. Other scientists observing that the diet and habitat of red pandas were similar to those of the giant pandas placed the two pandas together in their own family. However, recent studies comparing DNA sequences led scientists to classify red pandas as the only living species of their own family they're distinct enough to not be classified with either because they have enough DNA, enough changes in their DNA sequence. And so that is something that you're going to see when we talk about classification. Classification is not a simple process. It is very difficult to group organisms based on common, shared common um, characteristics because which of those characteristics matter? Is it looks? No, not always, right? Because if you look at humans, we're a species. We have a lot of diversity in the way that we look. Other organisms like certain birds, you can have two birds that look very similar and to somebody who is not trained, they might think they're the same. But in fact, they're not the same species because they do not reproduce with one another. So looking at an organism is often not enough to determine evolutionary relationship. And so this would be a type of observational data, right? Looking at the DNA sequences to compare which one it belongs with. So the process of science is repetitive, nonlinear, and collaborative. So repetitive, again, meaning that we have to do experiments multiple times. Nonlinear because it's not just in one direction. It's interdependent 
uh, based on different groups and collaborative because multiple groups work together. So forming and testing hypotheses at, is at the core of science. The endeavor is influenced by three spheres. Exploration and discovery, that's the top orange one. Analysis and feedback from the scientific community, that's the purple. And societal benefits and outcomes, which is the blue. So all of these are going to play a role and influence the forming and testing of the hypothesis. They're all interdependent, right? And they're all going to work together to answer some question. And so what you really want to think about is that, and again, this comes back to COVID, if you see one study from one scientist, and again, if you've been watching stuff about COVID, you're seeing all kinds of different scientists making different claims. This one says wearing a mask works. That one says that it doesn't. This one says that it protects against, uh, the antibodies will protect against getting it again. This one says no. What you wanna be careful about is to, again, be hypercritical. If I see one study by a scientist that's making a claim, one scientist is not enough to sway me. And the reason is there have been instances of scientists making up data. It happens more often than you think. There have been numerous publications in scientific journals that have been retracted based on discovering that scientists made up their data. A very, very common popular one was um, Andrew Wakefield, a physician, was the doctor that wrote an article in the Lance, uh, Lancet, and he made the claim that vaccines cause autism, and that had major impacts. It led to a whole anti-vaccine movement because they believed that vaccines cause autism, and people became very scared and stopped vaccinating. Problem is, Andrew Wakefield then later had to retract that paper because it wasn't true. And there have been numerous studies against that that say that that's not actually true. So again, you need to be hypercritical and always think critically. Seeing something by one physician or one scientist, don't buy into the hype. See multiple scientists and multiple groups that are saying the same thing. That is carries much more weight. So the last part of this lecture is looking at the five unifying themes of biology. So these are the five themes, and then we're going to talk about them in more detail. Evolution is the core theme of biology. Evolution is used to describe all of the diversity we see in life. It's a core theme of biology. It's absolutely essential to the field of biology. Life depends on the flow of information. Structure and function are related. Life depends on the transfer and transformation of energy and matter, and we'll talk about this in a minute. Life depends on the interactions within and between systems. And so we're gonna break down and look at these five unifying themes in more detail. So first one, Evolution is the core theme of biology. Life is distinguished by its unity and its diversity. So if you look at these various birds, we have a flamingo, we have a penguin, we have a hummingbird. Notice there are a lot of diversities in terms of their structure, the way that they look. But there's also some unity and things that they have in common that make them be a bird. Webbed feet, um, a beak, wings, etc. So life is distinguished by both its unity and its diversity, right? There are things that organisms have in common, and then there are things that make them distinct. The scientific explanation for this unity and diversity 
is evolution. The process of change that's transformed life on Earth from its earliest forms to the vast array of organisms living together. So again, we had this one universal common ancestor, this one single-celled organism. And at some point during history, it changed and it split into two groups. It has some similarities, but it also had differences that made it diverge into two lineages. And this kept happening throughout life. We kept seeing things evolve and change over time. And that is due, you're going to learn, to natural selection. The process of which adaptations in which organisms are better suited to their environment, they will be more likely to survive and pass those traits on with greater frequency to the next generation. And then that is going to be more prevalent in the population. So Darwin synthesized the theory of evolution by natural selection. Now, Darwin was not the first person to say, to talk about evolution, but he was the first to come up with this natural selection theory. This, what he called descent with modification. And that is that it has to be heritable variations. So there were two main observations. One is that the traits had to be heritable variations. And two, overproduction of offspring. And what that means is that there are more offspring than a population can sustain, and there becomes a competition for resources. So if you have these heritable variations, differences within the population, and those organisms are competing for a limited resource, that is going to lead to natural selection. And that is that there is unequal reproductive success leads to an evolution of adaptations in the population because the better adapted the organism is for their environment, the more likely they are to survive and to pass that on with greater frequency. So what you're looking at on the bottom is looking at this population of beetles. And the initial population had a greater percentage of these light-colored beetles. However, a fire came into the area, and it blackened the soil, and so it changed the environment. So if you look at this population, it has varied inherited traits meaning some beetles are naturally lighter, some are naturally darker. These are inherited, though. They're passed down to their offspring. So if I look at that population, which of those prey would you guess would be more likely to be eaten by a predator? And the answer is probably the light ones. So what's going to happen is that this bird comes in, and it starts eating the beetles. And it's easier to spot the light ones. So it's starting to eat the lighter ones. And the ones that are left to survive are the ones that are darker in color. So certain traits are selected for. It gives that organism a advantage, which, which allows them to be more likely to survive and to pass those traits on to future generations. And so what ends up happening is, is when the dark ones are left behind and they start to reproduce, notice that your population has now changed. You have an increase in the frequency of the trait that gives the dark beetles an advantage, right? Because the dark beetles are more likely to survive if those are the ones that survive, they're going to reproduce. Now your population has changed. Notice that you started out with a population that had white ones mixed in. By the end of this, we have lost those light ones and the population has evolved to be more of the dark colored beetles. And that's because it gave them an advantage. We are going to talk a lot more about evolution later on in the class. We'll go through and talk about 
all of the nuances, all of the data in support of evolution, there's a lot of data in support of this, okay? Evolution is a change in the frequency of alleles, has to be heritable, right? So somebody who has a trait that's not heritable, not likely to be more likely to pass that trait on. So each species on Earth today has a family history. A species represents one twig on a branching tree of life that extends back in time through ancestral species more and more remote. So when you're looking at these evolutionary trees, if you look here, this where they're branched much closer to the animals themselves, that means that they're closely related. So raccoons are very closely related to weasels and otters. Those are the most similar. Raccoons and wolves or raccoons and dogs are very distantly related. Notice that they diverged a lot longer ago. So this is more recent, meaning they diverged more recently. And this is going to be a long time ago. They diverged a long time ago. And so if we look at the red pandas, again, the red pandas are put into their own group. They have diverged. They're separate from raccoons as well as separate from the giant pandas. And so this is just showing you an example of an evolutionary tree. Evolutionary theory is useful in medicine, um, conservation, and also agriculture. Through selective ble breeding of plants, animals, um, plants and animals, humans also act as an agent of evolution. As a result of artificial selection, our crops, livestock, and pets bear little resemblance to their wild ancestors because we have bred them artificially to select for particular traits. And so that is what we call artificial selection. It didn't occur naturally. It's through human intervention that we see this change or this evolution of these plants and animals. Humans have intervened to cause this form of evolution. It's not something that occurs naturally. So principle number two, life depends on the flow of information. The process of life depends on the transmission and the use of information. DNA is responsible for heredity and for programming the activities of the cell by providing the blueprint for proteins. So if we look at DNA, DNA is a double helix. It undergoes what we call complementary base pairing. A pairs with T, C pairs with G. So you can see that along the double helix, A pairs with T, G pairs with C. It's the sequence of the nucleotides, those letters in order, that give the information to make a particular protein. So this is the blueprint. You can think of this like if you're thinking about the English language. The nucleotides, the DNA, are like our letters in our alphabet. When you put certain letters together, you end up with a word, right? So R-A-T is going to give us rat. C-A-T gives me a different word, cat. Same idea for DNA going to protein. The DNA sequence is going to code for the protein. It's going to tell the cell what amino acids to put in order. So if we look at a DNA sequence, along the DNA, we have multiple genes. Genes are segments of DNA that code for functional products, meaning it codes for a protein or it codes for an RNA, but basically it's the coding portion of DNA. So if we look at the flow of information, 
the flow of information in the cell, DNA codes for RNA, RNA codes for protein. And so the way that this works is, let's say that this is our DNA sequence. So let me add some additional nucleotides here. A, A, A. So let's say that this is my DNA sequence. So the first step in the flow of information is a process that we call transcription. We are transcribing a similar language. And that's because DNA and RNA are both nucleic acids. So this is transcribing. It's transcription because it's a similar language. So what happens is an enzyme comes along and it reads the DNA. And it says, okay, here's an A. In RNA, RNA does not contain T. Instead, RNA contains U. So A would pair with U. A would pair with U. U, this would be U. T would pair with A. C would pair with G. G would pair with C. That's transcription. We're transcribing a similar language. Now, going from DNA to RNA is transcription, but going from RNA to protein is called translation. Because now we're translating from one language to another. RNA language is different than amino acid language. Nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, are distinct from proteins. That's why we call this translation. That would be like reading English and translating it to Spanish. They're two totally different languages. So what happens is, is now the mRNA is read by the ribosome, and the ribosome is going to come along, and it's going to read the RNA, and UUU is going to tell the cell that should code for phenylalanine. That's the amino acid. So we're translating. UUU, that nucleotide sequence, is going to give us the amino acid phenylalanine. UAG, this is what we call a stop codon. So instead of coding for an amino acid, this would stop translation. But this is how information is going to flow in the cell. DNA codes for RNA, RNA codes for protein. So the DNA is the blueprint. The proteins are the workers. They're what's going to do the work in the cell. They're going to act as enzymes to speed up chemical reactions. They're going to signal within the cell. The proteins are going to do a variety of things within the cell, but that is all determined by their DNA sequence because you can't make the right protein without having the correct DNA sequence. In terms of life depending on the flow of information, information from the external and internal environment includes the stimuli, the signals, and the pathways that regulate body processes and gene expression. So again, that means that basically that outside stimuli are going to signal to get that flow of information in the cell. So let me give you an example. So let me give you an example that's shown here. So let's say you ate breakfast, right? As you eat breakfast and your body digests your food, the purpose of digestion, break down food into smaller molecules, and then that food can move from the digestive tract, so from the intestines, into the blood. And then that glucose can travel throughout your circulatory system. It's going to travel through your blood. And the glucose is going to be dropped off to the tissues. And that, that glucose is used to make ATP. So when you eat, your blood sugar starts to go up. So your signal is your high 
blood glucose levels. Your blood sugar starts to go up because that food that you're digesting is now going into your bloodstream. So your blood sugar goes up. As a result, when your blood sugar goes up, your pancreas is an organ and it senses that change in blood glucose levels. It knows when blood sugars are high. As a result, the pancreas, pancreatic beta cells, are going to release insulin. Insulin is a hormone, so it's these purple dots, these purple triangles. So the pancreas is going to release insulin. The insulin is going to go into the bloodstream. What insulin does is that when it travels throughout the bloodstream, insulin serves as the signal to the body that glucose is available. So what that basically signals to the body cells to do is it tells your other cells in your body, all the cells in your body, hey, glucose is here. You need to start taking up glucose. So when insulin circulates, it's going to cause a glucose transporter to be put into the membrane. And now the cell is going to transport glucose in so that the cells can take the glucose in and use that glucose for energy. What happens is, is that as the the glucose goes into the cell, blood glucose levels go back to normal and the production of insulin stops. So this process is very tightly regulated. Your body is able to sense changes in blood sugar and it responds appropriately. If there, if the blood sugar gets too high, it's going to release insulin. Insulin is going to tell the body cells to take up glucose. If blood sugars drop, your body's going to produce a different hormone. It's called glucagon. Glucagon is going to tell the cells in your body to break down stored sugars so that those stored sugars go back into the bloodstream and blood sugar goes back up. So this is all a very tightly regulated process. If you hear of people having type 1 diabetes, for example, if they have type 1 diabetes, what that means, that's childhood diabetes. They are born with an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease means their immune system is attacking their own body. So the immune system is attacking the body and Specifically, it's attacking those pancreatic beta cells. So the immune system is destroying those pancreatic beta cells. When those cells are destroyed, the body is not producing insulin. And if the body is not producing insulin, that becomes problematic. Because again, insulin is the signal to your body that sugar is available and for glucose to go into the cells. No insulin means no signal for glucose to go into the cells. Instead, the sugar stays in the blood and the patients end up with elevated blood sugars. Their blood sugar is too high because without insulin, they're not taking glucose into their cells. And so that's why patients who have type 1 diabetes have to have insulin when they eat because their body no longer makes it, so they have to artificially give it. Now, Again, this is a very delicate balance, though. Giving yourself too much insulin is just as dangerous as not having enough insulin. Because if you give yourself too much and all the sugar goes into the cells, now your blood sugar drops. You're going to faint. You're going to have problems. So all of this network of signaling within the cells and within the body are interdependent. We have to have these signals and The body has to communicate with the other parts in order for it to work effectively. Next, we have that structure and function are related. The relationship between structure and function can be observed at every level of life. At the molecular level, the structure of a protein correlates with its function. For example, if I look at hemoglobin, on the left here is a picture of a hemoglobin molecule. Hemoglobin is the protein within red blood cells that is responsible for transportation of oxygen. 
meaning that it allows hemoglobin to pick up oxygen. So if I look at the structure of um, hemoglobin, it's four polypeptides, they're color-coded, so each of those is a different polypeptide chain. Two alphas, the gray and the purple, and two betas, the green and the orange. And you'll notice that within each of those subunits, you have this Fe, this iron, or this heme group. Each subunit has that iron in it, that heme group. That allows it to bind, um, that allows it to bind to oxygen. So hemoglobin has a very specific structure that makes it efficient in binding oxygen. Other proteins have different structures. Some have chains that intertwine, and those proteins are used for something different. They're used for structure and strength. But hemoglobin is a globular protein. It's kind of like a blob, and it serves a very specific function. It's used to transport oxygen. If you look at the cellular level, the long extensions of the nerve cells allow them to transmit impulses from your spinal cord to your toes. So you'll notice that we have these long axons, we have these dendrites, these little projections, and we have these exon terminals. These basically are going to allow signals to transmit over long distance in the body. These dendrites can hook up with other neurons to help transmit a signal from one part of the body to another. It has a nerve impulse. So this has a very particular structure. Neurons are shaped this way for a reason. If we look at the mitochondria, we're gonna learn about structure and function of mitochondria. Mitochondria is an organelle in cells. It's used in cellular respiration. What happens in cellular respiration, the last step of the process is called the electron transport chain. That is where the bulk of the ATP gets produced. This step takes place in this inner membrane, what's called the cristae. Now you'll notice this kind of beige color is the cristae or the inner membrane. You'll notice that the inner membrane has all of these infoldings. That is designed for a particular reason. The reason for that is that the electron transport chain, change the ink here, are these protein complexes that exist in this membrane. By having all these extensively infolded parts, it's increasing surface area. Basically, it's making it so the membrane is larger so you can have more proteins embedded in that membrane. Imagine if that just went straight across. That would be very little surface area. You're not gonna maximize ATP production. But by having this increase in surface area, that is gonna maximize your ATP production. And so again, structure and function are correlated. There is a reason why things are the way that they are. They serve a purpose. Life theory number four, life depends on the transfer and transformation of energy and matter. Energy flows through an ecosystem in one direction. It's not cyclical. It goes in one direction and it leaves. For example, the flow of energy in an ecosystem is it starts with the sun. The sun is solar energy. So energy enters the sunlight. It's converted into chemical energy by producers, plants. Plants are able to take, uh, they're able to take solar energy, they're able to take energy from sunlight and transfer that into chemical energy. So they're gonna produce chemical energy um, in the plants. Consumers, like animals, are going to come along and they're going to eat said food. They're going to eat the plants. When the animal eats the food, 
energy transformation is not 100%, meaning it's not going to be able to extract all of the energy from food and to be able to utilize that, some of that energy is going to be lost as heat. So notice that the flow of energy in an ecosystem is one directional. Sunlight to producers, producers to consumers, consumers are going to lose energy as heat. However, matter or chemicals are cycled through an ecosystem. Um, from the atmosphere and the soil, through producers, consumers, and decomposers, and back to the environment. So for example, if we're talking about what's called the carbon cycle, how carbon moves through an ecosystem. Well, the way that carbon cycles through an ecosystem is that plants are going to take in carbon dioxide. They're going to take in CO2. They're going to use that carbon to make glucose, to make sugar. So the plant is going to take that carbon and it's going to fix CO2 into a sugar. Animal comes along, it eats the plant, it eats that carbon. Animal's gonna incorporate that carbon into it. Animal's gonna do respiration cellular respiration. So when they break down food, one of the byproducts, carbon dioxide. They exhale, <sighs> CO2 goes back into the atmosphere and it cycles. When the plants and animals die, decomposers will break down the carbon as well. So matter or chemicals cycle through an ecosystem. So we look at, we'll look at later the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle. We'll talk a lot about how different elements will cycle through an ecosystem. So flow of energy is one directional. Matter is going to be a cycle. We're going to have a cycle. And number five, life depends on interactions within and between system. So the study of life extends from the microscopic scale of molecules and cells that make up an organism to the global scale of the living planet. Emergent properties are the result of interactions between the components of a system. An interesting emergent property that we will talk about in the chemistry lecture is that if you think about table salt, salt that we use in our food, for example. That is sodium chloride. Sodium alone is a metal. Chlorine alone is a poisonous gas. Yet, if you take that metal and that poisonous gas and you put them together, you get an emergent property. You get this new property that exists as a result of the interactions. It totally changes the property of the sodium and the chlorine. Now it's edible and you can eat it. Using an approach called systems biology, scientists attempt to model the behavior of biological systems by analyzing the interactions of their parts. And so systems biology often is used to try and explain some aspect of biology that maybe can't be addressed through um, experimentation, meaning that we have to come up with models um, to help explain those phenomenons. And so we're using multiple approaches to solve some aspect of biology. And so one of the things in my project as a graduate student actually was looking at systems biology, and it was using mathematical modeling to basically describe how a stem cell population stays a stem cell population. Because there were just certain things that we couldn't do with experimentation. So instead, we worked with the math department and we did this mathematical modeling and then did experiments to test their models and went back and forth to try and answer some question about life. So question for you. The teeth of grain-eating animals, such as horses, are usually broad 
and ridged. This makes the teeth suitable for grinding and chewing. Meat-eating animals, such as lions, have pointed teeth that are good for puncturing and ripping flesh. This illustrates red, a result of natural selection only, yellow, the connection between form and function only, green, a food web, blue, a result of natural selection, as well as the connection between form and function. So pause, and when you're ready, you're gonna hear the answer to this question. Okay, hopefully you've thought this through. The answer is blue. This illustrates both natural selection as well as the relationship between form and function, right? These animals have evolved to have teeth that have a particular shape because it gives them some advantage. They're dividing up resources, right? The horse is eating a different food source than um, the lion, for example. And so they've evolved to have different teeth, but those teeth also have that correlation between form and function. Structure and function are related. Teeth are shaped a particular way to carry out a particular function. And so this one is blue.